today we get to welcome our friend, Dr. Allison Fox Resnick. She works through the National Center for Research and Policy and Practice out of the University of Colorado Boulder. She is like all of us, which is one of the things we love about her. Um, she's a teacher, she's a coach, she's a leader. Uh, in addition to, and she leads with those things through her research. The, on the screen, you'll see the most recent publication that has been very influential in our work uh, around early mathematics and early literacy, the um, publication, Principal Leadership for School-Wide Transformation of Elementary Mathematics Teaching, Why the Principles Conception of Teacher Learning Matters. It's a long title, we'll work on that next time. <laughs> Uh, more importantly than the title, Allison is a friend, a colleague. She has just the right of skepticism about all of our work uh, so that we can continue to think and be really, really reflective and reactive to all of our contexts. She will be the first to say there's no one way, there's no silver bullet that's going to fit everybody that's in this room. It's about the people, it's about the kids. Let's welcome Allison to the stage. Thank you, Rusty. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I do want to add, I know it's confusing to see that I work for University of Colorado Boulder. I am here as a Michigander. Um, I live in Ann Arbor with my family, and I have a kiddo who's going to be joining the, the Michigan school system in not too long. So I'm also here as a parent, thinking about how can we make Michigan schools the best they can be for our kids. And it's been such a pleasure to have this local work um, alongside my more remote work to think about those big ideas in this, in this specific context. So. Today, I've uh, titled this, I changed the title last night, Rusty, sorry for the surprise, uh, <laughs> More of the Same or a Tool for Change. So we've seen documents like this before. We've all been in education systems for a while where um, they kind of just sit on our desk for a while and then get buried on a bookshelf for a while and then we forget about them. So. Today and tomorrow, I'm hoping we can dig into different ways where this can actually be a tool for change and for learning and for growth versus just more of the same. We're going to dig into organizational practices one and four, which I have um, particular fondness of, but let's, let's think about the ways we're engaging in them as ways we can engage in all of them and ways in which one and four actually intersect with all of them as well. Um, I have the clicker. Here we go. I'm going to start with something you all know. The work of educational leadership is really hard. It involves constantly juggling multiple things. I heard some people saying today, it feels so nice to be here and just have to think about a few things today. Not the many things I usually have to think about, right? There's fast pace for decision making. We don't have very long. We have to <laughs> respond to really unpredictable human relationships on a moment to moment basis, right? There's no way to predict what any of our days are going to be like, no matter whether we're in the classroom or in a district office. And we're trying to do these really hard jobs within complex and very entrenched systems within broader political contexts. Schools are not a bubble. <laughs> there is all sorts of stuff all around us that comes right into the classroom, that comes right into the school board meeting, that comes right into the ISD. We are constantly having to respond to those things. So here's the reality. This complexity makes it really easy for us to fall back on habits or on ways in which we have always just made sense of things. Really easy. And there's just recently more studies about how as leaders we do that. It's been in the research for a while how it's very easy for teachers to do that. 
now we're starting to study it more and how with really good intentions, leaders fall back on our habits because we've been in school systems forever. We have habits for how we deal with certain situations. We have really deeply held ideas that we're not even aware of sometimes about how we respond to particular situations. So that means even when we are trying to do something new or different, it's very easy to fall back into habits. So how do we make sure this document, there's a lot of words in there, it could very easily just be more of the same. There is a way to read this document where you say, oh yeah, I'm doing all this. There's a way to read it that way. Or there's a way to read it in which you're thinking about, how can I use this for really powerful reflection, to collaborate with my colleagues in different ways, to learn? How can I see these words as actually meaning something new versus just the way I'm used to making sense of my work and the habits I already have? So, today what I'm going to work with you on and the lens we're going to bring to the document is what are the ideas about our work that we need to make really sure we do not bring forward as we make sense of this document and we work with our colleagues to make sense of this document and bring it to life in our context. Because, and here I connect to value five, and one of my um, favorite phrases in all of the values, maybe the whole document, If we think that improving what's happening for kids is just about figuring out the kid learning challenge, then it's going to be more of the same. Okay, so let's try to dig into this today as what can we learn about the ideas that we might be bringing forward that we're not even aware of as we look at this document to think about what we need to do as educators, what we need to learn more about so that our kids can have more powerful learning experiences. Okay, so we're digging into practices one and four. These are just the bigger statements. There's lots of more specific under ideas underneath. Here's the thing, like I said before, you could read these and say, oh, I'm doing all that. Check. But you are bringing your idea, the way you're used to making sense of all of these terms, to your interpretation of that. There's a lot of different ways to make sense of every single one of those words. They're words we use all the time in education spaces, often kind of assuming, oh, we all mean the same thing. There's a lot of ways to make sense of those words. And for me, this is actually what drove me to leave the classroom. I experienced two different schools as a teacher that both said they were doing these things, in, but they were doing them in really different ways, right? In one school, I felt very supported as a teacher, as a learner, as a colleague. My leaders were working really strategically to think about how to organize the school as a powerful learning place for both me and my kids. In the other school, that wasn't really true. I'm sure in this room we've all experienced schools on all sorts of places in that spectrum, right? I became really passionate about how do we make more schools places like they could be for the adult learners, for the educator learners? Because there's lots of people saying they're doing this and they're doing it in ways that are not very powerful, not very... Um, good experiences for the, the grown-ups or the kids in the building. So, this morning we're going to dig into those practices and think about how should we make sense of them, what ideas do we need to leave behind as we make sense of them, and what I'm hoping you'll also see this as a, an approach that you could adapt and bring back to your teams, a way of constantly engaging with this document as you continue to think about what it means for your context. So overall this morning, 
the way I'm thinking about it is you're going to see two of many ways to dig into this document that's different than let's read it and talk about what it says. So Rusty and Susan just worked on you with let's look at them through the lens of the values. The values were very intentionally added in to the document this time because there's a way to enact these that does not reflect the values whatsoever. And there's ways to enact them that do reflect the values. The values are a way of trying to support us to think in similar ways about the underlying ideas that need to shape how we bring these organizational practices to life. What I'm going to engage you in today is this idea, this thinking tool really, <laughs> called thinking traps. Both of these are ways of naming what we want to move forward, move towards, and what we want to leave behind. So values is really naming what do we want to move towards, what ideas do we want to bring with us. Thinking traps is actually we're going to be naming what we don't want to bring. And that's not always what we do. We usually think about what we want to move towards, and sometimes that means we're not really thinking about what does that mean we have to leave behind. Okay. So let's dive in. Some of these, well, actually all of these, I think, are going to feel familiar. Here's what, how I think about thinking traps, and I've adapted this from a great book called Street Data. In that book, they're thinking about thinking traps specific to assessment and data and how we think about that in schools. Here, we're going to think about it more broadly. These are habitual ways of thinking about learning and educational change that are not effective, but they're built into our systems. They're the ways, since we were kids, we've observed schools work. They're often ideas we're not even really aware that we have. Here's the first one. So what we're going to do in a moment is look at the values and practices one and four. You can choose where you want to start here. A trap we fall into when we're making educational change often is we focus on little tiny bits and we don't think about how they all fit together. I'm sure all of you right now can think of an example in your head of a time you've experienced that in a school system, right? This work of putting the organizational practices across math and literacy is, should not be a novel thing, but it is. Because usually we think about all the content areas as siloed, even though teachers are experiencing them all together. Right? Usually we think about intervention for particular kids without thinking about the rest of their experience. Or we think about teacher evaluation without thinking about all the professional learning they're getting and how that interacts with it. So, in drafting this, we tried to be intentional to support people to move away from this trap. But still, as readers, we have to be intentional about not falling into that trap also. So I want you to look at, you can pick the values or practice one or practice four. We're going to do a little two minutes of independent think time. Where do you see intentional effort to move us away from this trap? And also look for where could we still fall into it. So you pick where you want to start. We do two minutes of independent think time, and then we'll share at our tables. Okay, we're going to share in a second, but I want to encourage you, if you feel comfortable, not all of us do, mark up your document. Because this is sense making you're doing of your document right now. Okay, so if you want to add post-its, you can. If you want to circle words, if you want to underline things, if you want to highlight things, this is how you're going to make sure your sense making goes with you over the next few months. So let's take a few minutes to share on this same question. Where do you see an effort to move us away from this trap? And where could we still fall into it?
Okay. So I hope you're seeing things like people are going to have a conception of what a leadership team means. If they don't really carefully look at some of the bullets about who maybe should be part of a leadership team, they might keep the leadership team pretty siloed around a couple people who don't necessarily have a strong sense of the many different pieces of a particular system. That is an intentional choice to try to nudge us away from just focusing on particular areas of the system versus thinking about the system as a whole, right? You may have also noticed in practice four, we very intentionally used the word integrated to talk about how our learning about what equity means in classrooms needs to be integrated into our thinking about what it means to teach mathematics effectively. And then ideally, we're thinking about the connections between what it means to teach mathematics effectively and what it, teach, it means to teach literacy effectively, that those aren't two separate things they were thinking all together about just what does it mean to teach effectively with equity in mind. Let's check out the next trap. Oh, actually, I wanted to make this point. A meta way we could fall into this trap. First, we could think about all of the organizational practices separately. Okay. We could just say, let's focus on uh, number five today, and next week we'll focus on number six. As you're starting to see, hopefully already, one and four, just focusing on those two, they intersect a lot. Okay? Another way you could do it is you could say, well, we're going to work on the values for a few weeks, and then we'll dive into the practices. Okay? This document, ideally, to avoid falling into this trap, you need to always be thinking about how all of the practices connect. And how they connect to our other tools. There's a lot of learning to be done to connect the dots between how do these organizational practices support us to bring the math essentials to life or support us to bring the literacy essentials to life. There's connections there that we have to make as a team. If we just focus on one document on its own, we're not going to be doing the work that we need to do for our kids. So that's a meta way we can fall into this, this trap here. Let's look at the second trap. So here's how I like to think about this trap. Uh, we kind of think people don't have it. Okay, so I could assume today, uh, you don't know anything about the organizational practices, but if I talk to you, if I have the best PowerPoint slide for an hour and a half, <laughs> and I give you the document and let you read through the bullets, then guess what? You're going to have it. And you're going to go back and do magical things in your context, and everything's going to be different. Okay? I hear laughter, and it's because I'm sure this feels familiar. So... Let's take a moment to think about examples of where we've fallen into this trap or seen other people fall into this trap. Be honest, if you can, about times you have fallen into it. I fall into it all the time. So let's share at our tables, and then I am going to ask for a few people to share out. So if you feel comfortable in two minutes, I would love for you to share out. Let's share examples for two or three minutes here. Okay, this is probably going to be a hard one to stop talking about, but I am going to pause you. Do we have a few brave volunteers to share examples of times you've fallen into this trap or experienced this trap? Um, I fall into this trap all the time because my personality is a very perfectionist, excellence type of personality, very linear. And so when I value something, I think immediately other people need to value it to the degree of passion that I 
value it as well. And so it's very hard for me to realize growth change, you know, change takes a lot of time. Value is very deep. It's very long. It's something that's, you know, a mile deep as opposed to a mile wide. And I need to make sure that I slow down and allow others to percolate that value themselves, if that makes sense. So I'm going to use my table of meats example here. Um, you all probably experienced this the last few years. Our graduates are coming out of college without knowing how to do reading assessments and running records. So not even a one-off experience. I'm going to say a no experience. They're in a classroom, and they're expected to deliver um, assessment results in a data warehouse for analysis, and they've really never been introduced or have a clear understanding of how to do it. Or why, yeah. Any others? Okay. This is a trap we fall into at all layers of our system. Think about the number of times we hear teachers say, well, I showed him how to do it. <laughs> okay. We, then we do the same thing with teachers. Well, I told them how to do that lesson. Or I gave them the feedback to stop doing that. It was really well delivered even. I like had a compliment sandwich, right? I did it all right. <laughs> and they're not doing it, okay? We also do this with curriculum. Well, if we just spend all of our money on the very best shiny curriculum and give it to our teachers, everything will change, okay? It's, it's everywhere once you start to see it. So let's look on my next slide here. Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to not fall into this trap before we look. I forgot about that. So, often we think about professional learning. Let's zoom in on professional learning here. We think about it, and I heard some people saying this at their tables in terms of like, what do I have to do tomorrow? Or what's that thing next week? I have to fill up two hours, right? Or over here, what's the role of the principal? Let's just think about that for a little bit. What I'm going to encourage you to think about, and this is a little bit of a thinking tool that I'm going to give you a brief preview of. If you want to learn more, come hang out with Sonia and I in the breakout this afternoon. We're going to dig into this tool a little deeper. One way to think about professional learning systems is that you have to think about the roles, the events that are happening, the routines that are happening, and the tools. So let's zoom into this a little bit. Roles means the way roles are enacted. As all of us have experienced, there's a zillion ways to be a principal. What matters about how those roles are enacted is part of thinking about your professional learning system. Routines are the common patterns of interaction that we do all the time. That could be how we look at data. That could be what's our observation cycle look like. That could be that we always do an exit ticket at the end of a PD. They're recognizable and repeatable. Events are either planned events, so this is a planned event, or they can be incidental events. So I run into you in the hallway and we have a conversation. That is also part of my professional learning system. And then there's the tools I experience as a learner. Those can be both, and this is important, the tangible tools. So you have a tangible tool in front of you. The practices, the organizational practices are a tangible tool. If you internalize one of the values and deeply believe in it, that's also an intangible material or tool. That's an idea that you are using to do your work. Now, it's important to notice these aren't like clear categories. They all interact. They often all happen within an event, right? But if we just think about the event and not the other pieces, or if we just think about the roles and not the other pieces, we're missing parts of the system. And here's the other thing. If we think about anyone's learning over time, so there's time, there's my learning. Does it go straight? No, it's all over the place. And it's supported over time by all of these things in interaction with one another.
but we're still missing a piece that often gets forgotten here. It matters what kind of community I'm in when I'm experiencing those things. If I go to a super amazing PD on how to do something different in my classroom, but my community in my school makes me feel like there's zero way I could take a risk and do something different, there's no way I'm doing it. If something's hard and I don't feel like I can talk to my colleagues about how it's hard and how they're problem solving that, there's no way I'm doing it. So, this is one way of representing a lot of different research on what actually supports professional learning. I want you to take a look at practice four. And see if you can figure out how does, it, how does practice four try to map onto some of these ideas. In other words, how do you see practice four trying to move us away from one-off delivery of perfect PowerPoints? Or one-off delivery of the perfect feedback? And I love that I see people underlining. Okay, will you share something you're noticing? It's okay, you're not done. We're just practicing some of these lenses. Will you share something you're noticing with this lens with your table? Okay. I know, again, there's a lot more to say here. Part of what I'm trying to do here is show you an opening into conversations you can have in your context. So that was a two-minute version of what you could imagine being an hour-long or a multiple different hours-long conversation with your teams about what is actually here and how is that different than our typical approaches that we tend to fall back into of, well, how do we fill up that two-hour chunk over there, right? Or, oh, teachers need to learn about this, or principals need to learn about this. Let, what can we deliver to them, right? What does the PowerPoint need to say? So notice how these conversations engage you in a different way with looking at, at what the words are on the page, and hopefully you're getting a little taste that you can bring back to your, your broader teams. Okay, here's trap three. And I want to encourage you to think about how we fall into this trap again when we think about our learners as kids, when we think about our learners as teachers, when we think about our learners as instructional coaches or principals or district leaders or even ourselves. This connects with the one we just looked at, in that, again, we're assuming someone doesn't have it, doesn't have anything, okay? I could walk in here and assume, oh, I have so much to teach you. None of you know anything about school systems, right? Or I can walk into a classroom and think, oh, I really have to teach them addition. They don't know addition yet. Or I can walk into a teacher's observation and just focus on what are they not doing? What are the gaps I can fill? What are the deficits that need fixing? What do I need to show and tell them? So again, it's focusing on what do people not have so I can deliver the magic thing to them so that then they'll have it. Okay, let's look at the values. This is one we actually revised for pretty heavily. Over the last 
When was the first version written, Susan? 20... 2016. So if you can remember back that far, we were not quite as explicit and clear in the education community about trying to not view kids through a deficit lens. So a big layer of the revision was catching that language that was baked into the document and revising it. So let's look at the values or practice one or practice four. You can pick where you want to go. I want to encourage you though. Do you see places where we're also trying to push you to not think about teachers or leaders through a deficit lens also? So where could we, where did we try to push you away from this trap? And how could you still fall into this trap? Because these ideas about people having deficits that we need to fix as a baked in idea in our system that we need to really intentionally disrupt. Go ahead and take a look. Yeah, you want me to just switch it to stable and two? One, two. Yeah. I would love to put out in the room here if we can. Are there any ways your tables notice where we could still fall into this trap? Places where we're going to have to be really careful? Um, one thing that we talked about is it's very easy to fall into this um, when you're in a situation with some top-down leadership. And as a coach, you have an administrator reach out and say, this person needs this fixed. And so we have to walk in and kind of tiptoe around that and build the relationship before we can even think that there's anything that needs to be fixed. That is such a great example of how baked in it is, right? We're surrounded by it. This one makes me feel a little uncomfortable because I have absolutely had this perspective with people I work with and with kids I've worked with. And it doesn't feel that great to recognize, but it's baked into our systems. And I just want to call out, this is going to be an important one for you to bring across all of the practices. All of them are. But there are practices in here about how we think about assessment, how we think about intervention, how we think about summer education. Those are three big buckets in our system that we often think about kids through a deficit lens with. We have another. Great. We didn't talk about this at our table, but we've talked about it before. One way that we can see the deficit mindset is through curricular tools. Like, it's so embedded in some of the tools that we've picked up and scanned for and done crosswalks with, you know, building wide initiatives or even the essentials. And if you really start looking for it, it's so subtle that it can be really scary. <laughs> for sure. There we go. Uh, these are really baked in. And that's all of them are. This one is especially sneaky, as you're pointing out. Let's do the next one. Let's think together. What examples come to mind of this one? Where we view the necessary change as, well, we just need to figure out how to fix the kids. Or we just need to change how we engage kids in learning. And then everything will be better. Go ahead and think for a moment. And when you feel ready, share an example with your table. Where have you seen this? Again, be brave if you can and vulnerable. Is there ways you've fallen into it? I have. Or have you seen others? Or have you been caught in a system that is thinking this way? I 
I know this is another one you could talk about forever. I want to say two things about this one. And I heard both of these ideas kind of circulating as I was walking around. One idea is that this isn't just at kind of a systems level, it's also at a kind of moment-to-moment -moment interaction level. So one of my favorite studies by Kara Jackson out of the University of Washington, they looked at teachers, and they looked at whether teachers, when they saw a kid struggling with something, there's two, they, this is, you know, creating two categories for something there's lots of different categories for, but the two ends of the spectrum were either teachers saw it as this is something that's wrong with the kid and I can't do anything about it, or this is something that I haven't supported them well with yet and I need to do something different. That's in the moment-to-moment -moment decision making as a teacher, and here's the second thing I want to say. That's a moment-to-moment -moment decision making thing as leaders also. When you see a teacher struggling with something, or when you see a principal struggling with something, do you think it's because of something that's wrong with them that you can't do anything about because you already delivered the perfect PowerPoint, right? Or do you think, huh, what have I not done to support them well yet? What do I need to learn to do differently? So that's the second thing I want to highlight here. I named the trap in terms of kid learning and adult learning, but I also want you to think about this trap in terms of whoever your learners are and your own learning. So is a trap we fall into is this is the learner's problem or this is my challenge that I need to learn more about. That's a trap we fall into all the time. So let's do the same thing we've been doing of looking at values and looking at one and four. You pick where you want to go into this time and really think about where do you see an intentional push to move away from this trap and where could you absolutely still fall into it? we noticed here, what are the challenges going to be with this one? I'd love to put a few ideas out in the room. Where are the trouble spots? Um, we, I looked at number four, especially that second bullet, sub-bullet one, and that the learning opportunities um, have to foster trust. I think in order to reflect on your own practice, you have to be in, an, in a room or a place where you have trust to, and then the very next word is vulnerability. You have to, when you're reflecting on your own practices, you have to have, you know, you have to be vulnerable to that. And the next word is curiosity. You have to be passionate and really look at, at what are you curious about to do better the next day or the next hour or the next minute. Um, and have the experimentation and the critical reflection. Um, I think reflecting, you know, we always, you know, how can I make tomorrow better? What did I do good today? What do I need to fix? I think that's cr critical. <laughs> so that's what we kind of talked about. Anyone else? I'll be brave. <laughs> so we talked about the MTSS process and how typically it, it fosters that deficit mindset. So they immediately go to, you know, this is what the child can't do. And even with working with math interventionists, literacy interventionists, it's this is what they can't do. And how do we, when we see the MTSS process as truly a prime opportunity to give teachers differentiated support. So what is it that you need in your classroom first to help move these kids. So it's, we can see where that can be a trap. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. One of the, the ways at an organizational level I see schools and districts fall into this trap all the time, something I just want to say out loud and have you think about in relation to this trap. Often, when we see kids struggling, we pour more money into interventionists than we do into professional development. Or, when we see teachers struggling, we pour more effort into their professional development than into their principal's professional development. <laughs> or, if we see principals struggling, we pour more money into principals' professional development than we do into thinking about the role of their supervisors or into the messages we're sending from a district level about the role of the principal, right? So we talked about the moment-to-moment -moment interactions mattering, but also we fall into this trap all the time in terms of what we're spending money on. So I've seen districts trying to pick a new math curriculum. They kind of liked both. One's super expensive, one's pretty cheap. They decided to go with the more expensive one which meant then they had no money left for professional learning with that curriculum, right? So we make these decisions with our funding. We fall into these traps with where we spend our money. That's another way we see us falling into this trap of who's the problem and how do we fix that problem versus looking up a level, okay? All right, let's move on to yet another one. And this is related. So you can fill that blank in with anything, right? If you've been a math student, then you know how to teach math. If you've been a teacher, then you know how to teach teachers. If you've been a teacher, then you know how to be a principal, for sure. Um, if, you know, if you've been a principal, then you can definitely be a principal supervisor. We forget that these are all different jobs. Just because you're a good teacher doesn't mean you know anything about supporting someone else to be a good teacher. This is a trap we fall into all the time. I see a lot of people nodding, right? So this is again what I was just saying. Where do we put the money for professional learning? Where, where do we really invest in thinking about what a profession, where, where our professional learning systems are and who is a learner in our system? A big problem is that we often associate leadership with you're done learning. And often leaders think they can't show up as a learner. Right? I can't, I can't show up at that math professional development and ask a question about math teaching, I'm supposed to know all about that. Or I can't, as a principal supervisor, show up and pretend I know about how to be a principal in, during a pandemic. I have to pretend I know, right? Because I've been a principal. So, what other examples can you think of of this one? And I want to call out something I heard at a table that's important, connection back to the very first slide I showed you. One of the things I said at the very beginning is, when things have to move quickly and there's a lot of pressure, we fall back onto habits and we fall into traps. So when we need to fill a spot and we need someone to do that job and it's urgent, we put someone in that spot and we think, well, you were a teacher, so you're going to be able to figure out how to support all of those teachers. Check, right? Because of the nature of our work, which it's fast paced and there's a lot of pressure and we have to figure something out now because there's kids sitting in that room right now, right? So I'm hoping you're seeing these aren't, these traps aren't things to feel ashamed about. 
although sometimes I do. There are things that are baked into the system and that the system keeps pushing us to do. If we don't have money to pay for professional learning for those people or they don't have time to come out of their jobs, then we're forced into this trap. If there's kids in the room that just need a teacher, we're forced into this trap, right? So it's not about um, feeling ashamed and feeling we can always avoid these traps. It's about constantly looking out for these traps. So let's practice with this one. Where could we fall into this trap as we think about these particular focal practices? And I want to call something out here that's important about what we we're talking about, of thinking about everything together. Look at the last value. Value number five, the last sentence or phrase, I guess, that I highlighted earlier. This is an example of how the values can help us, if we really pay attention to them and bring them through, can help us try to avoid the traps as much as possible, right? If we're really pulling through, oh, we have to think about adult learning, we have to think about adult learning, we have to think about adult learning, it might help us avoid this trap. If that's not something we're thinking about, guess what, it's not baked into the system, and guess what, we're gonna do practices one and four without really thinking about this, and we're gonna fall into the trap, right? So. Look, pick where you want to focus for this one. Where do you see words that could help us move away? Or we just talked about the value helping us move away. And where could we still fall into this really easily? We're going to do one last trap. Here it is. Conceptualizing equity and our goals as educators in relation to equity is primarily about making test scores similar. Maybe let's take a minute at our tables to just say, what does this mean to us? How are we making sense of this trap? I want to put a few of our ideas out in the room here. What are we not thinking about or designing for or leading for if we fall into this trap? What gets missed if we fall into this trap? Anyone want to share? I just shared that I do some aggregating of data for like our uh, administrative stakeholders. Um, but I always have to make sure that I'm giving the background knowledge to say like, you know, even though we might have a certain percentage of children falling below a level of or standard of school readiness that we're looking for, I'm in the preschool realm. I still have to tell them, but now here's the accompanying growth information that you need to see like this yeah there's a percentage of kids who are like meeting the expectation but if i show you the growth that that certain sector of kids has made so we can fall into that trap of not acknowledging the growth that those kids have made and i it reminds me of i i think also when we talk about um you know making the test score similar you miss the, the message about making sure every child gets what they need. And when we talk about, you know, helping, lifting everyone and all boats rising, when we focus on giving each child what they need, it leads to better outcomes for us. And you could get at the, that goal as well, potentially. 
Uh, I'd just like to take a minute to call out an educator in this room who helped me better understand this trap. Um, and her name is Mrs. Kim Van Antwerp. I think she's over there. Uh, she serves in Forest Hills. And Kim and I served together. And in the teacher principal role that we had, Kim was so powerful in helping me understand equity from the lens of looking at where our money and our dollars go, not just for our striving learners, but those learners who are on the other end of the spectrum as well. And she was uber passionate about that and really helped me better understand how we're serving and supporting that entire spectrum. So thank you, Kim. Okay, so we're hearing a few ideas here about what gets left out. When we think about this from an organizational practices lens, which is what this document is, if we just focus on test scores, we're sometimes also falling into that trap of it's a kid's problem. If we just figure out the way to fix the kids and make the test scores similar, then equity will be achieved. It completely ignores the fact that our school systems are built inside of structures in our society that are inherently unequal and inequitable. And our school systems are built on those ideas too. And our leadership practices and our behavioral response practices and our teaching practices, that all of those layers are part of what makes a school system more equitable and makes kids' experiences in schools more equitable. If we just focus on test scores, we're not seeing kids for who they are we're not seeing teachers for who they are. We're not seeing our communities for who they are. And we're not seeing our school systems for what they are within, within broader societal structures and political systems. So this one's a little trickier. I want you to look at the values and practice one and four. Where do you see ideas that could help us Remember not to just focus on changing test scores. Where do you see ideas that are pushing us to think about other layers of equity, societal levels of equity, as they interact with our school systems and our classrooms? But I do want you to all turn to the values. Because this is again a place where if you don't bring the values into your interpretation of all of the practices, you can fall into this trap and all the other traps we, found, we talked about today, but this trap in particular. I've, as I walked around, everyone was saying, this trap is everywhere. We have to spend so much time giving kids tests. We have so much accountability for what those test scores look like, right? The rhetoric of achievement gap and closing the achievement gap is everywhere. So this is very much baked into the system and we intentionally chose some values there to help nudge us outside of that trap. So here we are. We've thought about two different ways of digging in. Rusty and Susan, we thought about the values and how the values can help us interpret that. We've continued that by thinking about the thinking traps that we can get caught in as a lens. Again, these are habitual ways of thinking. They are baked into our system, which is what I heard all of you talking about as I walked around. And what I want to call out is that baked into these traps are different conceptions and assumptions and visions that we have. So part of what we talked about today was our conception of professional learning. And another thing we talked about was our vision of leadership, right? What does it mean to be a leader? So if we think about vision of leadership, these kinds of questions, oops, oh, can we go? Oh, can I do it? There we go. Back one. We all have these ideas. We are going to bring those ideas into our interpretation of this whole document.
if we're not careful, we might bring ones forward that aren't useful. We have scripts for what it means to be an educational leader. Same with conception of professional learning. We've all sat through a lot of professional learning. We are basically given recipes for how to do it, right? We will fall into the recipes that we don't want to fall into, where we're operating on certain goals, on certain ideas about what learning is, on what supports that learning, about our role in supporting it, right? We are going to fall into that if we don't stop and question it. So those are just two sets of ideas, assumptions, conceptions that we have. There's other ones that are going to be important for your teams to grapple with. What's student learning? Your ideas about student learning are going to really impact how you interpret all of these practices. What's assessment? What's the purpose of it? What's a good test? What do we look at afterwards? How often do we do it? Why do we do it? It's going to be really important to dig into that. Otherwise, you're going to bring ideas you don't want to bring forward. Even this idea. Practice 10 is all about summer learning. There's some deeply held ideas in society, let alone in educational systems, right? About what summer learning is. We need to stop and notice those ideas and question them and think about which ones do I want to bring forward before we, oper we decide what to do with these practices. So I want to stop for one second and have you think, what are some other traps? I just gave you six. I think there's six pretty useful ones that can be used for all of the practices, but there's a lot more. When you think at your tables, what are other traps we could fall into? What are other habitual ways of thinking? I heard one over here earlier. I'm going to just go ahead and say it out loud. There's a trap right now of we just have to get back to normal. <laughs> that seemed to resonate a little bit. So what are the other traps we fall into all the time that we need to be really careful to notice as we go forward with this work? Go ahead for two minutes at your tables. What other traps? Okay, I wish we could put all of these out in the room, but... I know we're hungry. So I'm going to pull you back together. But I hope over lunch, maybe, you share some of these thinking traps because I heard them just exploding at tables. We can all think of them because they're just the water we swim in, right? And the things we can fall into because of the nature of our systems. And I heard all of these ideas again and again and again as I was walking around, right? Well, because it was so fast, we had to do something. Or because my principal told me I had to do it. Or because we didn't have the money, we had to do this, right? Or because we have to do all these tests, then this is what happened. This is the way our systems are built. And this document can be something that helps us reimagine our systems. Or it can be something that helps us keep our systems the same. Because as we try to do something new, we always, always, always fall back on our habits. Especially when it's fast-paced and pressured and we feel constrained by what's around us. So again, this can go two ways. If you write anything on your document right now, some of you have scribbles everywhere. Some of them are pretty pristine. I'm going to really encourage you. Can you write down this question? What ideas about our work do we need to make sure not to bring forward? If there is one thing you write down, if you really don't want to mess your document up, write it on a post-it. I get it. Write this down somewhere. What ideas do we need to catch ourselves in? I've been working with the math task force for about a year now. It's, it's a joy. And we've thought these thinking we found these thinking traps to be a really powerful tool for catching ourselves. They've become a tool we use in conversations where we notice ourselves falling into them. 
They've become a tool we use for reflection where we intentionally build it in and say, let's pause. What thinking traps are we falling into right now? They are a useful tool to build into your teams, whether you take the exact six I just showed you or come up with your own that you, own that you really want to focus on, up to you. But I really encourage you, as you move forward with making sense of this document, to think about the thinking traps you need to learn your way out of, the thinking traps you need to learn to see, so that we are engaging in powerful learning as educators so that our kiddos can experience powerful learning. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. <laughs>